Hatsumi Miwa is going to be a serious threat within the Kulin games. No, this is not a joke. Yes, I am being serious. And I do think that there is reason within the series of Jujutsu Kaisen to conclude that useless Miwa will break out of her shell within the Kulin games art. So in this video, I'll be breaking down all of the evidence and reasoning that I've gathered in order to tell you why you and everyone else in the series should be wary of Miwa moving forward. Now in this video, I'm going to have to accomplish three separate things in order to not only establish why I think this is possible and likely within the context of the series, but why I think this is even a possibility for a character who has only displayed weakness in her fights thus far. So let's start with the first question. Why do I think Miwa has the potential to be strong? Before I answer this question though, I'd like to talk about the sponsor of this video, Raid Shadow Legends. Every great game has some serious challenges waiting near the end, something you can really dig your teeth into if you want to master it. Well in Raid Shadow Legends, that end game is the Doom Tower, and it's a heck of a ride. This huge tower is basically a giant prison. The Arbiter fought a pack of really nasty bad guys a long time ago, but she wasn't strong enough to take them out for good. So instead, she locked them up in a massive super tower until she figured out how to deal with them. Well, it's been a few thousand years or something, and there's still a Doom Tower, so I guess we know how that went. What's worse, now that Sarath is leaking back into the world, the Arbiter doesn't have the power to keep the wards up, so the Doom Tower is failing, and it's up to us to go in there and knock some heads before they get out. To climb to the top, you're going to need an army of champions. The regular Doom Tower floors tend to be pretty easy to deal with if you've got a strong team, but the bosses are really tough and you need some serious specialists if you're going to beat them. I could go on for ages talking about how to try and fight these bosses, but the real fun is trying things out and experimenting for yourself. And this month, Raids just released a giant new feature, Awakening, and a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you're good enough to take down the Iron Twins, you'll see a huge payoff being able to awaken your champions. Awakening your champions lets you choose a powerful blessing that can transform how they perform in battle. But wait, here's the big news. Raid has just released a super powered legendary version of everybody's favorite champion, Death Knight. The whole raid community has been waiting for this for a long time, and the best part of it is everyone can get him for free just by logging in. All you have to do is log in and play raid for seven days between now and October 27th, and you'll add ultimate Death Knight to your collection as easy as that. There's seriously never been a better time to get started, but there's more. You can also use the DK Rises promo code for a bunch of free items to instantly level your new strongest champion all the way to level 55 star ascension. This promo code is available for both new and existing players. And if you haven't started playing raid yet, click my link in the description or scan my QR code on screen here and you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free epic champion, Virgis, 200k silver, one energy refill and one XP boost along with one ancient shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here and it's that easy. Just click the link in the description and I'll see you in the game. Huge thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video and with that we can get to talking about Miwa. The first reason that I think Miwa has the potential to be a powerful force within Jujutsu Kaisen is one that often goes overlooked by people simply because of the fact that it hasn't been extrapolated in the mainline material yet, and that is the fact that Miwa was scouted as a Jujutsu sorcerer, specifically because of her hair and natural ability to seek her spirits. This specific fact comes from the Jujutsu Kaisen fanbook, and I find it interesting because this clearly is a different process to become a sorcerer than the norm. Typically, new students will come from a line of Jujutsu sorcerers and simply become one themselves because they are of that lineage. Kamo, Gojo, and even Naoya are examples of this process. Even in situations that deviate from the norm like Megami's, we know that he is scouted by Gojo specifically because of Toji's request and the fact that he was seeking powerful allies. If Megami did not possess such a direct tie to the powerful Zenin family, I doubt that Gojo would have even bothered bringing him over to his side. So the fact that Miwa, of all people, was an outsider to the Jujutsu world and recruited simply because of her hair when she possesses no technique implies that her hair, whether it be for its color or cut, has some worth or history within the jujutsu world. If it didn't, I doubt that the higher ups or whoever recruited her would even care to have someone like her become a sorcerer. Now, let's all ignore our bias against me was displayed strength for a second and think. If a jujutsu sorcerer thought it was appropriate to spend the proper resources searching for and then recruiting characters with Miwa's distinct physical qualities, does it then make sense for her to have no potential as a sorcerer? Would it really logically follow for her to merely cap out as a 
grade three. I don't think so, especially when the only other character who has been explicitly shown to be recruited or scouted without previous connections was Ao Toto, a character who in Gojo's mind was one of the few who would go on to surpass the realm of special grade altogether. Whether or not you think this is possible for Toto moving forward is almost irrelevant because in the eyes of Gojo, it was possible. And even if Gojo didn't think it was possible, we see that Toto made a name for himself as an incredibly powerful and competent grade one sorcerer, one strong enough to take multiple grade one curses and a special grade on with relative ease. Miwa being the only other character we know to be scouted out properly makes me think that it is extremely possible for her to become strong within the verse, even without an innate technique. In fact, even if you were to some reason disregard the fact that she was scouted out, we have examples of characters in the story that possess no technique yet remain strong enough to become a grade one sorcerer and even go beyond that. Characters like Yuji and Kashimo are some very obvious examples of this, however, they aren't the people I'm going to compare directly to Miwa, because while they have no curse technique or rather don't display it in their on-screen fights, they themselves have some innate property that makes their insane strength much more possible. Yuji obviously has physical attributes enhanced to superhuman levels, and while Kashimo doesn't have the same superhuman base power, his massive amounts of cursed energy and cursed energy properties make it possible for him to contend with powerhouses like on a roll Hikari. Rather than compare Miwa to those two freaks of nature, the character that is the blueprint for the bare minimum that Miwa can achieve with just her simple domain is none other than her teacher, Kusakabe. Kusakabe is a character who goes under many people's radars, and it honestly makes sense why. Up to this point in the series, he isn't someone that I would say is super intimidating or even someone with that insane of a presence to them. However, some key moments in Shibuya would clue us into his deceiving level of strength. The first indication of his impressive power comes from chapter 83, where we have a direct confirmation that he is indeed a grade one, a symbol of competency in the sorcerer world in itself. The second and honestly more interesting indication of his power comes from a statement that may May makes when referring to Yuji, where she says that he is the only one outside of Kusakabe to become this strong without a cursed technique. This is high praise for Kusakabe because up to this point, Mei Mei has gotten to see Yuji fight in multiple different scenarios and circumstances. In the Kyoto Goodwill arc, her crow should have observed Yuji's training with Toto. She should know that both Yuji and Toto were the ones who fight a high level special grade curse without dying, and she knows that Gojo is confident enough in his power to have her recommend him to be a grade one. On top of this, Toto himself can't stop singing the praises of Yuji to Dory, which should clue her in to just how powerful he is. In Shibuya, Meimei should have an even better grasp of Yuji's strength, considering that she is seeing his physical abilities firsthand, and the speed at which he dealt with a semi-grade 1 also should clue her in a bit into how strong he may be. This means that at the bare minimum for Kusakabe, he's long since reached the level that beginning of Shibuya Yuji has displayed, which is impressive in and of itself because it means he can take on decently powerful special grade curses alone under the right circumstances. Now, the third and most important thing that displays is Kusakabe's strength is his feat of blocking Kenjaku's maximum curse technique, and even getting praised for being someone with a little know-how by the mastermind of the series himself. This maximum technique feat is impressive for a lot of reasons, the obvious one being the fact that he was able to not only protect himself from taking damage from the attack, but he was also able to shield three other people behind him. The not-so-obvious impressive part of this feat is the fact that he was fast enough to come between Miwa and the attack particularly before anyone else could. The fact that he can pull all of this off without a technique and just with the power of a simple domain means that, in theory, Miwa should very plausibly be able to as well. She very well should be able to do the same things as Kusakabe given the right training, or the right circumstances. Keep that in mind because her circumstances and the catalyst that she may experience are things that I'll be doubling back on later in this video, so just remember that I said that. Now, while this level of potential is impressive and certainly not anything to sneeze at, even being a competent grade one sorcerer can only get you so far in an environment where the best of the best across generations are fighting and showing off their skill. So why, in spite of this seeming like a soft cap for her power, am I so convinced that she will play a larger role than many expect within the game? We've established that she has the potential for growth with Kusakabe, but why do I think she has the potential to even exceed this level? Why do I think she is going to be someone that is a a great asset to whichever side she is on. In order to answer that question, I need to pull back the scope of this video a bit and take a look at Miwa as a character and the strange amount of focus that Gege has been giving her considering the role she plays in the story.
As a character, Miwa gets a ridiculous amount of shine within the series, considering the fact that she is essentially just a background character. Whenever the Kyoto students are reintroduced, she gets some sort of special moment that really differs from the others. Miwa is the only character who hasn't had a very serious, dedicated fight to them, but still has quite a bit of emphasis placed on her character. For example, in the baseball game back in chapter 54, we get a monologue from her and her alone. This may seem like a weird detail to harp on, but this game in my opinion is going to be called back to with her, just like it was with Megami, with Yuji, and arguably with Maki. You also have moments like her last talk with Mekamaru in chapter 128, where Miwa has to come to terms with the fact that she wasn't strong enough for Mekamaru to think that she could handle herself in Shibuya. Her uselessness is called back to once more, and in some form, I think Gege is really going to show us Miwa trying to shed that part of her identity. Just like Megami working to rid himself of his self-sacrificial nature, or Yuji ditching the idea of being anything more significant than a cog, or more recently with Maki, her completely detached herself from the idea of being like everyone else, I think Gege has a character arc for Miwa planned where she'll work towards eliminating that useless feeling. And I think the setup is there. While the other students do talk about Mekamaru's death and the fact that he kept them out of Shibuya in order to save them, none of them get the amounts of screen time and focus that she does in this moment, something that I think speaks for her potential usage further in the series. Gege is laying the foundation for her character to blossom later within the manga. Even in the very climax of the Shibuya incident arc, you have Miwa pull up behind Kenjaku in monologue about herself and her past, before swinging her blade at him with everything she has and coming face to face with her weakness once again. Very similarly to someone like Yuji, even when Miwa puts her best effort forward, she is thwarted again and again and again leaving her the opportunity to evolve beyond these losses and grow. Once again, no other Kyoto student gets this treatment against Kenjaku. She alone gets this internal monologue, and she alone is the one who Kenjaku aims his maximum technique at. To take this further still, we see that in chapter 181, Miwa is walking in Sendai Colony, completely alone and drawn in a way that highlights the seriousness of her situation. Now, one can only guess why she's in Sendai, but all we know is she she shows up seemingly out of nowhere, and the fact that she shows herself within the Cooling Games an entire nine chapters before the other students do is something that I think should not be dismissed so easily. This recurring idea of her uselessness and powerlessness to do anything for anyone, combined with the fact that she has shown off to us more than a character of her importance typically would, implies to me that there is going to be a major shift not only in her power as a sorcerer, but her importance within the overarching narrative of Jujutsu Kaisen. Now, as I said earlier in this video, all all that she needs to achieve the intended growth or the theorized growth is a catalyst, an incentive to grow. And I think that this very thing was granted to her in Shibuya, and it may have been granted once more in the Culling Games. Kenjaku has ruined the lives of countless innocent people. Every single victim of the Culling Games and even the lives lost in Shibuya and prior in some way connect back to Kenjaku including Mekamaru, someone Miwa deeply cared about. Imagine the turmoil that must be stirring through her heart as she thinks about the position he was put in by Kenjaku and how much that has to have hurt her. To make matters worse, we know that Miwa is an older sibling with a family that she provides for and tries not to be a burden on. And I don't know if you all have noticed this yet, but Gege doesn't seem to like happy sibling dynamics. Choso lost his brothers to Yuji, someone who he later realized was his own brother after almost killing him. Toto lost his hand and technique while helping Yuji defeat Mahito. Megami lost his sister when he was just a middle schooler to some crazy curse that he didn't understand. And even worse luck, now that she is awakened, she's in the Kulin games. And Maki, she lost her sisters to the hands of her own family and proceeds to live on with the only remnants of her sister being a cursed tool. Long, tragic story short, Gege likes putting siblings through the ringer. Now, by just applying some basic pattern recognition, we could hypothesize that Miwa and her siblings will be put through the ringer in a similar way that these characters have prior. And the Culling Games is the most natural way for that tragedy to strike. For a second, just imagine this potential sequence of events for Miwa as a person. She finds out that Mekamaru was a mole within their rank. She later finds out that he did it in order to attempt to help everyone in the long run, 
but he died. She then comes to realize that Mechamaru actively kept her and her friends out of the fight because they were too weak. Before finally getting within reach of the one who orchestrated all of this, she swings her blade with as much power as she can and it is crushed before her eyes as she is reminded of her own weakness. Following these tragic events, she tries to go home to see her family, make sure they're safe, only to find out about the Kali games and the fact that her family is either dead or something worse. If that possibility isn't a reason to see some serious changes in a person, especially in a person that is literally fueled by negative emotions, I don't know what is. In my opinion, Miwa has all the necessary tools to make some real moves within the cooling games. The path to strength is there, the potential is there, the motivation is there, and the buildup is there. My prediction moving forward is that Miwa will be a very, very important piece of this arc. Just you wait.